Well, hello and welcome to this afternoon's presentation, This or That. My name is James Stevenson. I'm with the United University of Florida IFAS Extension Services here in Pinellas County. We're a partnership with the county and the University of Florida. And what we do is we provide research-based information for the citizens in the county. Welcome to Zoom. As everyone has been logging in, we've been seeing the numbers climb up, which is great. Uh, we are attempting to record today's presentation so you can watch it at your leisure at another time. Um, it will be on our YouTube channel, which is Pinellas Extension TV, dot, uh, Pinellas Extension TV on YouTube. While Zoom has a lot of bells and whistles, I don't. So for today's purposes, if you have any questions or comments or complaints or anything you'd like me to know, uh, to do better in future, we're always looking for that sort of feedback, uh, just send me an email at my email address, which is jstevenson, that's uh, for James Stevenson at pinellascounty.org. So keep track of your questions, send them to me. Uh, if you think of anything later, that's quite all right. Uh, it's what I do and it's what I'm happy to do. So we've got about half of our participants signed in now. So what I thought we'd do first uh, is just ask you please to take a quick poll. I'm gonna launch this poll. It's gonna ask you a few questions just because we want to see um, how you found out about today's program. So if you'd like to tick one of those boxes, you should have that ability uh, to uh, select one of the answers. Another question, uh, how many adults are watching? Um, is it just you? Are you with your friend? Are you with your partner? Are you with your roommate? Uh, how many youth are with you as well? Um, we'd like to get a clear count. We, have, we know how many people are logged in, but we don't know uh, how many other people we're with today. So we'd like to know these, uh, this information as well. So y'all are doing a fantastic job. Uh, the numbers are rolling in. Um, we just like to keep these kind of records. Um, while you're filling this out, I'll just mention, you might have thought it strange that you had to provide uh, gender and race, and now we're having to ask you how you found out about us and how many people there are. That's because the University of Florida IFAS Extension is ultimately a, a branch of the uh, federal U.S. Department of Agriculture, and that is a federal entity, and thus we are bound by affirmative action. So we have to show that we make an attempt to reach as many and a, as a diverse an audience as possible. So thank you so much for providing your information today. We've had about three quarters of you uh, chime in, so that should give us a good sample size. I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll and close that out for you. Welcome to this or that, a program about commonly confused species of plants and animals. I'm James Stevenson with the University of Florida, IFAS Extension in Pinellas County. This presentation is developed from a field guide that my boss, the natural resource agent, Lara Milligan here in Pinellas County, uh, we came up with a field guide. I'll give you a quick, you might be able to see it. It's gonna be back to front. Um, there we go. It's called This or That. It's the same as this presentation, only much more comprehensive. It's got text and photographs on how to tell uh, very familiar species apart. And that is available uh, from the IFAS bookstore, uh, the IFAS extension bookstore. You can find just by typing that in. Um, Lara and I do not get any personal cash from the sale of this uh, guide. It's merely a resource for the citizens of Florida uh, to help them uh, guide their way through perhaps just a natural curiosity about the plants and animals around them. And I'm pretty sure that's why some of you are here today as well. Today we're going to cover birds, uh, some commonly encountered birds, uh, mammals, the ones that you may or may not see, uh, reptiles and amphibians, which are all around us. And if you have a thing about snakes, uh, don't worry, we have a, a warning so you can avoid your eyes if, if you're uh, not too keen on uh, images of snakes. 
We'll go over plants and we'll finish up with some commonly confused trees. So I hope everybody's all right with that because that's where we're going to go. And we'll start with the birds. And we've selected birds that uh, you can see without binoculars. That You don't need to get you know, microscopic differences to tell them apart. Some of the little songbirds are much trickier uh, than these larger birds. Uh, these are birds that you can observe uh, from your car, on a walk, in a park, that sort of thing. And we'll start with the stars of today, uh, the featured creatures that were on the home screen when you signed in, the black vulture and the turkey vulture. Now we all get that we have vultures and we all know hopefully what vultures do. They provide a very important ecological service by disposing of carrion, that's dead animals. And they have certainly similarities. They have bald heads, both of these have bald heads that allow them to get their head inside a carcass without becoming fouled. They also have these hooked beaks that allow them to tear the flesh away from whatever they're eating. Uh, that characteristic, the hooked beak, uh, uh, made scientists think in the past that they were related to the raptors, but they're not. They're actually their own thing. And the vultures here in central Florida, we've got the turkey vulture and the black vulture. And here they are side by side. You can see the, the size is very similar. And I probably don't have to tell you what the most obvious difference between the two is the color of their head. And the turkey vulture is called a turkey vulture because it has a red head like a turkey. And the black vulture, a gray head. Um, in flight, these two can be told apart. Uh, the black vulture has white wingtips. If you can just see that, or maybe you'd call that gray. Uh, but just the tips, you can see a contrast in color. And the tail. The black vulture tends to fan their tail out and it looks very, very blunt. So blunt tail, black vulture. Long tail, turkey tail, turkey vulture. And the turkey vulture's wings have lighter color throughout the entire length. You can often see the color of the head as well, uh, even when the birds are flying. This is what we call a kettle of in this case, black vultures. A kettle is a rising air current. Uh, let's say that the air passes over a parking lot and the parking lot is hot and the air begins to rise. Birds can take advantage of that rising air and just spread their wings and circle round and round and round. And they can kind of spiral their way higher and higher and higher. And they can see better and better the higher they get. The black vultures have excellent vision and they can spot a dead animal from miles above uh, the surface. Turkey vultures on the other hand have an excellent sense of smell and so they usually soar lower in the kettle because they can smell what they're after, uh, dead animals of course. Sometimes these vultures that are circling, uh, people believe that they're actually circling something dead, uh, like the vultures in the old world in Africa and Asia, they have that uh, characteristic, uh, but not our vultures. They're not circling something dead. They're simply riding an air current to avoid having to flap their wings too much. Not that they're lazy, they're smart. Our next pair of birds would be the large water birds known as the double-crested cormorant and the anhinga. Now, both of these water birds are fishers. They swim underwater, completely submerged, uh, using their powerful webbed feet to paddle through the water in search of fish that they use their beaks to catch. Since they have to submerge, their wings have to become completely saturated. Most birds, uh, can secrete a wax, an oil that they can spread on their feathers to keep them from being waterproof. Most birds want to be waterproof, especially on a day like today um, when it's raining so heavily. But the cormorant and the anhinga completely submerge in search of their prey. So in order to get their feathers dry and clean for maintenance, they sit out of the water and uh, fan their tails and their wings out in this drying formation. So that is one way that they look very similar, their feeding habits and the way that they dry their wings. There's kind of an interesting way of telling the two apart. If you think of the word A for anhinga, and an A is a pointed letter, like the point on the bill of the anhinga. 
The cormorant, which starts with a C, has a curved beak like the letter C. So anhinga and cormorant, their names are practically written on their face, right? Also, when they're in the water, they look very different. Another name for the anhinga is the snake bird. Uh, the anhinga swims with most of its body submerged, only emerging its head out of the water, uh, ostensibly like a snake. The cormorant, on the other hand, when it's in the water, swims more like a duck with its body exposed before it dives down to get its prey. Our next pair are the big white wading birds. Uh, we have two, uh, we have several white wading birds, but these are the two that are most often uh, confused. It's the great egret and the snowy egret. People like to call uh, all the white egrets snowy egrets. Perhaps you've heard of a snowy egret and didn't realize that the other even had a name, uh, but there are differences between the two. The great egret, as its name implies, is a rather large wader. Here it is compared to a duck, uh, a bird that most of us can uh, visualize the size of. The snowy egret, on the other hand, is about the size of or smaller than a duck. So a little snowy egret and the great egret uh, differ in size. The great egret, as an adult, has a bright yellow bill. And this bird is actually uh, in its breeding costume, if you will, uh, the skin around his eyes and nostrils, that's called the lore, L-O-R-E, has turned this bright emerald green. That's a signal that it's time to get married. The snowy egret, on the other hand, when mature, has a black beak. And here you can see the lores of the snowy egret are yellow. And that kind of leads us to our next difference between the two, and it's the feet. The feet of the great egret, which you can observe when it's flying or when it's perhaps walking around the neighborhood looking for lizards in the shrubbery, uh, they're black. Uh, the great egret has black feet, whereas the snowy egret has these yellow feet that match its lures. You can see that when they're flying or wading as well. Slightly vulgar way to remember, the snowy egret has yellow feet. Uh, some people know something about yellow snow. I'll leave it there. And we'll look at our next pair of birds, the woodpeckers. Now we have a very common woodpecker in central Florida, which is the red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, the red-bellied woodpecker happens to have a red stripe on his head. Uh, a lot of people have heard of a red-headed woodpecker. They see a woodpecker with a red head and they say that must be a red-headed woodpecker. But there's actually an, a species called the red-headed woodpecker whose head is completely red and wings are boldly patterned in solid black and solid white, as opposed to the more laddered or barred uh, coloration of the red-bellied woodpecker. Now, this is an important difference to make because the red-headed woodpecker needs a very specific habitat that's sadly absent in our county. It needs old growth, old dead trees uh, that it can um, make its cavities in for nesting and we don't have enough old growth left in Pinellas County to support a population of red-headed woodpeckers. So conservation of this species depends on uh, the conservation of lands with plenty of old growth trees. The red-bellied woodpecker on the ha other hand is very well adapted to development and they can be seen in neighborhoods uh, searching on tree trunks for um, insects that they pick off the surface. They don't actually hammer into the wood for their food. They pick it right off the surface. It's kind of a, a nicer way to live than slamming your, your head into, the, into a, a, the trunk of a tree over and over again. So here they are side by side, and you can see those differences a little bit better. The solid red head of the true red-headed woodpecker versus the, the red striped head of the red belly. And yes, you can just barely see a little bit of red on the belly. That's not something that you're probably going to be able to observe in the wild. So those are just a few of the birds that might be difficult to tell apart. Now we'll have a look at some mammals. Mammals, of course, having fur and producing milk. Uh, did you know we had two rabbits in Central Florida? We have the common and well-known Eastern Cottontail, but we also have the more secretive marsh rabbit. Uh, the Eastern Cottontail, as we 
as the name implies, has a nice white tail that he flashes when he's running away. Uh, these tend to feed in the open. They tend to have very large ears, very large eyes, so they can see and hear a predator coming as they feed in the open. The marsh rabbit, on the other hand, is much more secretive, as I mentioned before. And they have smaller eyes and ears. They tend to creep around wet areas, thus their name, marsh rabbit. They kind of walk more than hop, and they search around vegetation for nice young shoots. They'll even swim in a pond to get from one side to the other. So the marsh rabbit, uh, you might be able to observe around a community pond, or perhaps there's one in your neighborhood. Uh, if you do see a rabbit, check to make sure if its ears aren't just that little bit shorter and its eyes a little bit smaller, and almost no hint of a tail at all, much less a big white cotton tail. Another pair of mammals, uh, of course, the, the majestic Florida panther and the bobcat. Now, how do you think you could get these confused? And the reason that we've included this in our field guide and as well as today's presentation is we get a lot of questions from the public and a lot of claims from the public. And we've had several claims of people seeing panthers here in Pinellas County, and Pinellas County is 98% developed. Um, it is very likely that someone has spotted a wild cat, but it is vanishingly possible, there's a vanishing possibility that they saw an actual panther in Pinellas County. Uh, but the bobcat, um, the panther with its very long tail, very distinctive, it's a huge cat, you know, over a hundred pounds, um, needs vast, vast acreage of undeveloped wilderness uh, for its survival and for its hunting techniques. The bobcat, on the other hand, is very well adapted. Um, there are a lot of bobcat in Pinellas County, not just here on a preserve, but they can exist in parks and smaller preserves as well. They're just very good at hiding. But occasionally, one might run in front of the, a car or something, um, and someone might think, oh, I just saw a panther because they saw a wild cat. Uh, bobcats can vary in coloration. They can be spotted, stripes, uh, a combination of both, and sometimes they're just solid colored. So a solid brown, long-legged cat bounding across the road might give someone uh, reason to think that they had seen a panther. Dogs, yes, we have a dog that is loose in Pinellas County, a wild dog, a coyote. And I'm sure you've all heard about uh, coyotes and coyotes' ability to be quite happy in uh, developed areas. Um, they can be mistaken for dogs, but there are very, very few, if any, um, stray large dogs in Pinellas County, generally speaking, because we're so densely populated, a stray dog that doesn't have an owner, doesn't have a collar, um, is usually taken care of quite quickly. Um, whereas the coyotes, they can elude capture and uh, they can exist and reproduce quite happily in developed areas. The coyote is a very long-legged, very pointy-nosed, very pointy-eared, uh, large, uh, they're often very skinny as well. Um, the footprints of a uh, coyote versus a dog, again, very elongated, like the nose and the legs of the coyote itself. So this, this paw print is very elongated, whereas the domestic dog tends to be much rounder. And there's other differences. This lobe is missing or not. Um, so that's where you can kind of tell if, if a stray dog has been running around or perhaps a coyote. It's very likely that it has a coyote. There is no part of Pinellas County that hasn't been visited by coyote. And the animal services started with a map that they were planning on uh, charting known uh, verified coyote sightings in the county and it eventually was a completely filled up map. So there's no part of the county where coyotes don't exist. Did you know we had a couple of different squirrels? Silly old squirrels that might bother our bird feeders? Well, now we have a choice of two. We've got the large fox squirrel, which is sometimes called a monkey squirrel, and the eastern gray squirrel. Now everyone's familiar with the eastern gray squirrel. They inhabit our neighborhoods and trees and power lines. They're everywhere. They're very well adapted to developed areas. The fox squirrel, on the other hand, they tend to exist in uh, meadows, 
pastures and open ground like golf courses. So if you or someone in your, uh, in your family or one of your friends is a golfer, they may have encountered one of the large fox squirrels. The fox squirrels are very inquisitive. They, um, they like to hop up in golf carts, for example. They learned that certain containers contain certain treats. So in some cases, they become somewhat of a pest. Uh, here, it's important to remind everyone that it is not only uh, not a good idea to feed wildlife, but it's actually illegal to feed wildlife. So um, let the squirrel be a squirrel. Uh, don't encourage by giving any handouts. The fox squirrel, uh, there's several different subspecies. The one that we have here in Pinellas has this really cute uh, white patch on its nose and a very dark head. Uh, when you see them, they really are much bigger than a, than a gray squirrel as well. And the fur on their tail, tails tends to be white tipped as opposed to the more blackish tipped tail uh, fur of the gray squirrel and the even color across uh, the entire fur coat. Those are a couple of mammals. Uh, and now we're going to look at the herps, which is short uh, for the reptiles and amphibians are the herps. And now's where, if you have an aversion to snakes, um, maybe you just wanna turn your head while we discuss the differences between a few snake species. It's important to tell the difference between uh, some of these as well. Um, but our first pair will be the Florida water snake versus the water moccasin. Uh, now, they both obviously occur around the water. They're aquatic. They swim. They actually hunt small prey in and around uh, water. And the Florida water snake would like nothing more than for you to mistake the Florida water snake for a cottonmouth. Uh, the Florida water snake kind of uh, pretends to be a moccasin by having similar um, coloration. That also helps them hide uh, in, in marshy areas, that coloration. But a quick way that you can identify this snake from a safe distance uh, is the presence of these lines through the ostensible lips of the snake. So you see these bars that's very characteristic of the water snakes. The moccasin, on the other hand, does not have those bars through the lips, but instead has this chestnut patch that runs from the eye down to the chin. And those characteristics are what we use to observe these snakes from a safe distance and make a quick identification. Now a safe distance is something that we must stress. Um, if you see a cottonmouth in what is called its defense posture, you're way too close. Uh, we advocate for people observing wildlife every day of their lives. You know, go out and look for as much wildlife as you possibly can, but keep a safe distance. Um, one of the differences, of course, between the water snake and the water moccasin is the moccasin is a venomous snake. Um, you should never get close enough to a venomous snake for it to pose any danger to you whatsoever. 98% um, of snake bites come from people trying to catch or kill a venomous snake. So what's the takeaway message there? Mm hmm Just keep a distance. Very good. Now, we've included a photograph of the copperhead, um, and I want you to note the caption. Uh, the copperhead in Florida is a rare northwest edge of the panhandle. Rare. Not here. Uh, some people would see a water snake and become sure that they'd seen a copperhead and perhaps do something unseemly. So copperheads, not here, nothing to worry about. Here's another case of uh, camouflage. We've got a juvenile black racer versus a pygmy, a venomous pygmy rattlesnake. You see the patterning, the coloration of the juvenile, kind of similar to that of the um, pit viper, the pygmy rattlesnake. Again, the little baby black racer would like nothing more for you to think that it's a venomous snake. Also, uh, the coloration is cryptic, so it allows it to hide uh, in vegetation uh, until it grows up. And when it grows up, it loses that uh, mottled coloration, becomes solid black with a white chin. The pygmy rattlesnake, on the other hand, can, uh, keeps this cryptic coloration or warning coloration if it's out in the open uh, year round. And here you can see the posture 
of a pygmy rattlesnake. Um, most of the time it sits coiled. It's a lie in wait predator waiting for something to walk by and then it can um, en envenomate that prey. But again, pygmy rattlesnakes pose absolutely zero threat to humans as long as you keep a safe distance. Our two, two, I should say, two of our lizards, uh, two different anoles, uh, the brown anole or the Cuban anole and the Carolina anole or the green anole. As the name, as one of the common names implies, the brown anole is not native. Uh, it arrived uh, by human activity uh, into Florida and it has proliferated throughout the Southeast US. Uh, there are conflicting opinions on whether or not it can be considered an invasive species uh, because uh, we haven't quite got good enough science on the impact that this species has had on our native Carolina anole. One thought is that the Carolina anole has become more arboreal. That means they've taken to the trees and let the brown anoles have the ground uh, for their territory. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of these two lizards. Uh, you can see perhaps that the green anole has a much slender, uh, I wanna say beak, but that's not the right word. What am I trying to say? Mouth, head, nose, there we go. So he has much slender in nose and mouth area, whereas the Cuban anole is a little bit more blunt. Um, the dewlap, which is this um, kind of semaphore that these lizards have, these particular, this genus of lizards, uh, is yellow tipped or yellow edged, I should say, in the brown anole, whereas it's a solid color in the green anole. Now, the green anole does us the great uh, disfavor of sometimes being brown. And here we have a brown anole and a brown Carolina anole. The Carolina anole is able to change color. Uh, it's called metacrosis. Uh, when it's angry or scared or cold, uh, the Carolina anole can turn brown. Uh, when it's excited, it can turn bright green again. So, but you always want to check for the patterning on the brown or Cuban anole. They have much more intricate patterning, both males and females. Uh, the, the Carolina anole can sometimes have little white dots down the spine, but it doesn't get any more exciting than that. This or that tree frogs. Uh, we have the difference between these two is important because the Cuban tree frog with this red box around the outside indicates that it is an invasive species. And it's invasive, it's taking a toll on our native tree frogs, which is not a good thing because our native tree frogs do are so well tuned to our environment they keep all of our, um, all of their prey victims in check. Whereas the Cuban tree frog is indiscriminate. It eats anything it can put in its mouth. So uh, it's on the loose and it's doing quite a lot of damage. The main difference between the two uh, are the size of the toe pads. Cuban tree frogs have these almost comedy sized toe pads. Now our native tree frogs also have toe pads that they use to help cling to surfaces but they're ridiculously large in the Cuban tree frog. So that's one of the first differences. Cuban tree frogs can get to be as big as your hand as well, as big as a grown-up's hand anyway. Um, most of our native frog, tree frogs do not get that size. Another difference is that the Cuban tree frog's eyes are big and bulgy, much more big and bulgy than our native tree frogs. And now I'm gonna give you an, up another disclaimer. I'm gonna show you uh, a graphic visual on just why the Cuban tree frog is such a problem in our area. It eats even our native tree frogs. And here is a Cuban tree frog swallowing our one of our cute little green tree frogs. So I'll go ahead and zoom through that. And here's our cute little native green tree frog being cute and little and very welcome in our ecosystem. What do you do if you have a Cuban tree frog? You've properly identified it. You can catch it, uh, but you don't want to re-release it. Uh, the University of Florida recommends um, putting some benzocaine on the belly of the tree frog, popping it in a jar, and putting it in the freezer. The benzocaine is a numbing agent. It's what's found in the toothache medicines. Those are almost 100% benzocaine. Uh, you can just keep a little bottle of toothache medicine swab it on the belly of the toad or tree frog and cl put it, close the lid, put it in the freezer and the animal will be asleep before the freezing happens. So it's a humane way to dispatch these animals.
and then wash your hands. Anyway, moving on to our next pair. Uh, these are some toads. We've got the cane toad, which you might have heard of. These get in the newspaper every year because every year a small dog decides it wants to put one in its mouth and um, results can be quite disappointing for the dog and the dog owner versus our native southern toad. They do look very similar, but the differences are visible from a safe, again, safe distance. So two ridges, small poison gland, little lumps on the head, little poison gland behind the ear. That's our native um, versus the very large poison gland that reaches almost down to the belly on the cane toad and no ridges on the top of the head. Um, Cuban tree frogs, I mean, uh, bufo cane toads can get to be quite large as well, like the size of a small guinea pig. I'm not making it up, they get huge. Again, if there's one in your sphere of influence and you have it correctly identified and you wanna dispatch this amphibian, uh, putting benzocaine on its belly before popping it in the freezer um, is the way to humanely dispatch. So now we'll move into some plants, um, just to, not too many. I happen to be a botanist and I could go on all afternoon, but I wanna let y'all get back to your lives. Um, we'll look at two ground covers, one native and one, look, a red outline, invasive. These are two sunflowers. One is called the beach sunflower and one is called widelia which used to be a scientific name, but uh, now it's the, a name that it goes by commonly, Wedelia. The beach sunflower is actually a Pinellas County native. Uh, it makes a wonderful ground cover. Uh, you'll note the resemblance to the, the, its uh, sister, the, the true sunflower, uh, with that dark eye in the middle. It can make a very successful ground cover, uh, a native ground cover, providing uh, nectar and pollen uh, for our pollinators. Um, it's Perennial, it lasts from year to year, uh, but with Delia, on the other hand, um, it's gotten out of control. It was a very popular landscape plant because it's evergreen, it flowers most of the year, and nothing kills it. And when nothing kills it, what happens next? This hillside was one plant at one time. And if one plant were planted anywhere near a wild area, this one plant could completely wipe out our native vegetation in an area, completely overgrow it. The Wedelia can be uh, distinguished by its glossy leaves and lack of that dark center eye area. Now, these two plants don't look very much alike at all, but they're often confused for one another, believe it or not. Uh, this is goldenrod and ragweed. Goldenrod gets its name because it has these wands of inflorescences, this wonderful uh, golden yellow color. Um, it's a insect pollinated plant. Here we have the little individual flowers being visited by a honeybee who's also collecting pollen um, versus the ragweed who doesn't have showy flowers at all. All it has are these little green bracts and little uh, pollen factories. Uh, this plant is air pollinated, so it sends all of its pollen out into the atmosphere to be uh, blown around until it lands on the stigma of another ragweed. Now all that pollen in the air can affect our respiratory systems and give us allergies. Uh, goldenrod, on the other hand, with its sticky pollen that's meant to stick to pollinators, doesn't ever get into the air. So Ragweed cannot cause allergies because its pollen is never airborne. It's always stuck to a pollinator versus the ragweed pollen, which is always in the air. It's called ragweed because it has these very lacerated, very cut up uh, leaves you can see here. Here's one that we get quite a lot. People send us pictures of uh, these two vines. Of course, one is poison ivy and the other Virginia creeper. Both are vines, both climb trees, both turn very pretty colors in the autumn. They're not related to one another. Uh, they just have those similar habits. Uh, poison ivy, you've heard leaves of three, let it be. And here we have both the vines growing together. 
and here the poison ivy with the one, two, three. They're actually leaflets. This is one leaf that's divided into three leaflets, but you'll have to take a plant ID course to fully understand that, and we hope you will later this year. And here's the Virginia creeper with one, two, three, four, five leaflets. So the Virginia creeper, its common name actually means five leaves. But don't be fooled. You need, when you're trying to identify anything, make sure that you're seeing a trend. So here's a patch of Virginia creeper. One, two, three, four. I thought you said five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's more like it. One, two, three. Oh my gosh, does that mean that this thing is part poison ivy? No. Virginia creeper can have several different uh, leaf expressions, but the overall trend is going to be those five leaflets. Poison ivy, it's almost three all the time. Let's take a look at some trees to finish up this afternoon. Um, an invasive uh, versus a native again, the invasive Brazilian pepper tree versus a Dahoon holly. These are both evergreen trees that produce bright red berries uh, through the winter time, uh, but there are some important differences in case you have Brazilian pepper in your sphere of influence, you wanna tell the difference, make sure you know that it's a Brazilian pepper or make sure you know that it's a holly uh, because if it is a pepper tree, you're gonna to wanna to get rid of it. Both produce red fruit. The pepper tree produces in these long, uh, uh, the panicles of uh, berries. The leaves, again, are divided into little leaflets. The Dahoon holly has a single leaf that's not divided into these leaflets. Uh, Brazilian pepper tree also produces its fruit towards the tips of the stems. A uh, perfect placement for uh, being devoured by passing birds. And that is one of the most serious ways that this uh, gets around so much. The Brazilian pepper tree has invaded a lot of natural areas and has found its way even into urban areas where, you know, people don't really mind it. It's a quick, fast growing evergreen tree with pretty berries in the autumn. You know, once it was planted, it was called the Florida holly of all things. But now, of course, it's loose in our natural areas and we're spending tons of money trying to eradicate it. You may have heard a biological control was released last autumn uh, to try and control the spread of the Brazilian pepper tree. The holly does not produce those pendulous clusters of fruit. They just bear them rather close to the stem uh, in, large, in smaller quantities and larger fruit. And like I said before, the leaves are not divided. They're just a single leaf blade attached to the stem. We have two cypress trees. Did you know, did you care? Uh, one is called the pond cypress. The other is the bald cypress. Um, the pond cypress is Taxodium ascendens and the needles ascend from the branch. I'm not making this up. They're really doing that. Do you see? They ascend up off the branch. Whereas the bald cypress, they tend to be more feather-like they're disticus. They have little pairs of needles on either side of a central vein. So those are the foliar differences. Uh, pond cypress, ironically, tends to grow near running water and bald cypress tends to live in still water. They both produce cones, uh, little green cones that eventually turn brown to release the seeds. Bald cypress here in Stillwater, you can see they both have these buttressed trunks. Um, some scientists aren't convinced that they're two different trees. They just think that maybe they have slightly different expressions of their leaves and they're the same species. Uh, but we like, because we can tell the difference between the two, we like to say that there are actually two. So there you have it. Couple of palms, we have our cabbage palm and our saw palmetto. The cabbage palm has a leaf. This is a single leaf. This frond is just one huge leaf. And the little leaf stem extends right up into the leaf and curls around. In the saw palmetto, that leaf stem comes to an abrupt end when it meets the leaf blade and fans out into these little leaflets, like the palm of your hand. That's how they get their name. Cabbage palm also becomes something of a tree, a single trunk with a single crown. Uh, the structures on the trunk are called boots. Sometimes they're present, sometimes they're absent. 
They can get to be quite tall, majestic trees. And this is what saw, this is what cabbage palms should look like. They should have a nice round mane of living and dead fronds. The dead fronds are wonderful habitat for mosquito munching bats and other wildlife. Uh, you oftentimes see poor old cabbage palms with nothing but two or three fronds sticking out of the top. That's dreadful for the plant. It's absolutely terrible for the plant. All the fronds need to be left on until they fall off naturally for the tree to be as healthy as it can. The saw palmetto, on the other hand, can't ever really get off the ground, poor thing. I mean, and sometimes it can. Uh, they tend to have these uh, recumbent stems that just kind of droop and flop along the ground. Uh, that's because this species is meant to burn. Um, this is fire dependent. Uh, these plants have many, many uh, branching stems that allow them to have many, many um, uh, growing tips, unlike the cabbage palm, which only has the one. Uh, here's a nice short crop or patch of our saw palmettos and its native habitat. Uh, this is a pine flatwood that had burned in the past couple of years. Uh, the saw palmettos are nice and short. You can see you could walk in between these. If this were to get overgrown in the absence of fire, uh, this would form an impenetrable thicket, which is no use to human or animal alike. So I hope you got something out of today's presentation. Uh, most of the information comes from the electronic data information source at UF Extension. Uh, just a reminder that much more information on, on and from today's presentation uh, can be found in a field guide from the UF IFAS Extension Bookstore. Uh, the book is This or That, Commonly Misidentified Animals and Plants, created by myself and my supervisor, the natural resources agent in Pinellas County, Lara Milligan. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for your attention today. I appreciate